This lesson is going to cover chapter five in your Campbell biology book entitled The Structure and Function of Large Biological Molecules. The first thing that we can think about as we move into this chapter is the difference between organic and inorganic compounds. Inorganic compounds tend to be simple and they usually do not contain carbon. I say usually because there are obviously exceptions to the rule in where some inorganic compounds can include carbon, but for the most part they don't and they're usually very simple. Um, some good examples of these would be salts, acids, bases, and of course things like water. Okay, Organic compounds are more complex and they contain carbon, uh, carbon uh, backbones that we'll be talking about, um, and then of course carbon which is attached to hydrogen and oxygen as well. So organic compounds are much more complex and organic compounds are usually very simple. As we move into the next few slides and throughout this chapter, we're going to be talking about a variety of those organic compounds. Before we get into talking about those organic compounds, Let's, one, learn a couple new terminology, and two, go over some of the things that we've already talked about, okay? So one of the first things I want to talk about are monomers, okay? Monomers are building blocks for these larger organic compounds that we're going to be talking about. Okay, so um, examples of these... Uh, of course, for things we're going to be talking about soon, fats, carbohydrates, etc. Okay. Basically, what these monomers are is they're the building blocks for these larger molecules, and it is the smallest piece of these larger molecules that we can get to. So we're interested in this because when we talk about biology and we talk about living organisms, we're talking about being able, that a living organism is able to utilize resources from their outside, take them in, break them down, and then build them back up. And so when we talk about breaking things down, we're talking about breaking things down into their smallest building block or monomer. And when we're talking about putting things back together, we're talking again about taking those building blocks or monomers and putting them back together in order to form that larger organic compound. So if you remember in the chemistry chapter, we talked about a couple different things. The dehydration reactions was one of them. And you can see up here that the dehydration reaction, remember that was synthesizing a polymer. So if we put a bunch of monomers together, we are going to create a polymer, okay? So understand that terminology. So with dehydration reaction, remember the reason it's called dehydration reaction is because we are removing that water molecule when we put things together. So if we remove water, we can put monomers together and then eventually make polymers, which consist of multiple monomers. And that's what this um, picture is showing you. We've already talked about this dehydration reaction. Remember, remember we referred to this dehydration reaction as synthesis, dehydration synthesis. So um, dehydration reaction is the same as synthesis, which was also the same as anabolism. Remember, building things up. So kind of try to keep those things together in your mind. Okay, so let's move on to figure B. 
Figure B shows hydrolysis, and in hydrolysis, we are breaking down a polymer by the addition of water. So instead of taking out water like we just did in dehydration, in hydrolysis, we're going to be putting water in in order to break things apart. So in hydrolysis, which is also known as decomposition reactions, which we referred to before, so decomposition reaction, hydrolysis, catabolism, remember all of those things are the same thing. So in this case, we're taking polymers and we're going to break them down into monomers. All right, so we're going to start talking about the different categories of organic compounds, starting with carbohydrates. Okay, carbohydrates contain carbon, Get that in there, right? Okay, contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So it's a combination of all these different molecules. And uh, we usually think of car of carbohydrates as sugars and starches. They are very complex things. We eat them. They are necessary for us to eat to break down. And the function of the carbohydrate is for us to get energy, okay? So they um, can make energy in the body, and the body will use these, these for energy. They are energy storage molecules. So we definitely need to take um, carbohydrates in. We can break carbohydrates down into their monomer or building block, and the smallest... Uh, piece that we can get in a carbohydrate is a what is called a monosaccharide okay so monosaccharides are the smallest building block of a carbohydrate um, and that's where we want to be able to break it down in order to use it the best example of a monosaccharide is glucose you've all heard of it the body needs it in order to survive though other living organisms can use other types of monosaccharides humans need glucose. And so that's an example of a monosaccharide. Other examples of monosaccharides besides glucose would include fructose and galactose. Okay, if we put monomers together, we can, if we put monosaccharides together, we can get what are called disaccharides and some examples of disaccharides include sucrose, maltose, and lactose. So let's go ahead and take a look at these figures that show dehydration reactions. So what they're doing in these reactions is they're taking monosaccharides. Here we have glucose and glucose and at the bottom picture you have glucose and fructose and each one of these, the glucose or the fructose, are examples of our monosaccharides. So each one of these um, molecules or compounds are, is the smallest building block that we can get to in a carbohydrate. And if we put these monosaccharides together, then we can form disaccharides, and that's what you're seeing. So by taking out water, when we add glucose plus glucose, then we're going to get maltose. That's referred to as a disaccharide. And then if we put glucose and fructose together, we get sucrose, another disaccharide. If we continue to put these together, we're going to get what are called polysaccharides, which um, have... Uh, numerous amounts of monosaccharides added together. And when we eat carbohydrates like pasta, bread, we are eating them in the form of polysaccharides and having to break them down even further. I know this figure doesn't show it, but if we were to reverse the reactions and go to decomposition reaction, then we could take these larger molecule, molecules like the sucrose and the maltose and we could go the other way and break it down, okay? In order to do that, we would have to add water, and then we could break them back down into monosaccharides. So I know we learned about these concepts 
when we were talking about chemistry, the dehydration synthesis and decomposition reactions, but I want you to keep it in mind because every time we put these together or we break down these smallest building blocks, these monomers, we have to think about those reactions because they are coming into play. So biology builds on top of each other and I want you to remember these things. Let's talk about the next category of organic compounds referred to as lipids, okay? Lipids have a high proportion of carbon to hydrogen bonds, and this causes, causes the molecule to be hydrophobic. Remember, hydrophobic means water-fearing, if you mix water with oil, a fat, and you try to mix it together as much as you want, as long as you want, you are never going to get those to mix together because of the um, because of this high proportion of carbon and hydrogen bonds that allow it to be hydrophobic. The mo the main category of fats are what are called triglycerides. Triglycerides can be broken down into three fatty acids and glycerol. So it is a glycerol backbone that holds these three different fatty acids and the fatty acids can be composed of either saturated or unsaturated fatty acids. And we will talk more about the difference between saturated and unsaturated fatty acids in the next slides. Um, the function of triglyceride are they are an excellent molecule for energy storage, heat, and insulation. So these are the things that fatty acids are going to be used for. So let's look at some pictures and talk a little bit more about the difference between saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. All right, if you take a look at this picture here, and I'm referring more to this one on the bottom right here, what you'll notice is this is a triglyceride in its entirety. Um, and what you're noticing here is in the grayish box is where we have the glycerol backbone. And then in each one of these orange light orange boxes, we have the fatty acids. So if we break down a triglyceride, we would get the glycerol and then we would get each one of the individual fatty acids. In this picture up here, what they're showing you, this one up on top, what they're showing you is that by taking out water, we can attach the glycerol to the fatty acid. So this is how we're gonna put them together. Remember I mentioned uh, monomers, when we want to put them together, we put them together by dehydration synthesis, so removing water. So by the removal of water, we can attach each fatty acid to that glycerol backbone. And then again, if we wanted to reverse that and separate those monomers, so instead we wanted to separate the glycerol from um, the fatty acid, we would have to add water, okay? So we, by the addition of water, uh, then we would have decomposition and uh, or hydrolysis and we would be putting that water in and we would be breaking them apart. Keep these things in mind. We've kind of talked about this, but as we talk about monomers of each one of these organic compounds, keep in mind that we can break them apart and then we can put those monomers back together. All right, what about the difference between a saturated and an unsaturated fat? Okay, a saturated fat is given the name because the carbons of a saturated fat are saturated with hydrogen. Okay, and in an unsaturated fat, the carbons are not saturated with hydrogens. Are not saturated with hydrogens. And therefore, there is at least one double bond, okay? And the double bond that will be there the double bond that will be there will be between 
a carbon and another carbon, okay? If we have only one double bond, then that's going to be referred to as a mono unsaturated fatty acid. And that only has one double bond. Again, being carbon to carbon. And if it has more than one, it is referred to as polyunsaturated. more again that would include this and I'm going to show you some pictures so that you can understand what I'm talking about all right another fact is that saturated fats are usually solid at room temperature okay for example things like butter And unsaturated fats, we'll sneak that in here, are usually liquid at room temperature. Okay, so for example, uh, oils like vegetable oil, olive oil. All right, so let's take a look at this next figure to show you what I mean between the difference of an, a saturated fat and an unsaturated fat. Okay, what you'll notice is that when we refer to the fatty acids, again, remember that we're talking about each one of these that come off of that glycerol backbone. So each one of these would be a fatty acid stuck onto this glycerol backbone. In this figure shown, the glycerol backbone is right here, like a bluish aqua color. Okay, so we're, we're, we're interested in the ones that are in gray. If you look at all the carbons on this carbon backbone in here, all these carbons that line up in here, you'll notice that each one has hydrogens attached to it all over the place. So for those, because they have all these hydrogens attached to those carbons, that's referred to as saturated. So you notice that in this one. You also notice that in this one as well. But the one on the bottom, what you'll notice is that there are some carbons right here in the middle, okay, that do not include hydrogens all around it. And so because of that, they form a double bond so that they can be stable. I'll undo that so that you can actually see what I'm talking about. Let me highlight that or not. Okay, but here you, you see what I'm talking about right there. There's that double bond. Okay, and because of that double bond, it has, there's now this opening. So it's not saturated with hydrogen, so it's referred to as unsaturated, and instead now has this double bond. So if we only see one double bond like we see here, it's referred to as monounsaturated. If there were several double bonds in there, then it would be referred to as polyunsaturated. Now what this does is because in the other pictures, where there are saturated fats, there's hydrogens all over the place, it makes it very difficult to break down those fatty acids because there's, it's very difficult to get into the carbon area, the carbon bonding area, when all those hydrogens are blocking the way. But down here in the monounsaturated fat, it makes it a little bit easier to get in and break things up because now there's that hole in there where those hydrogens no longer are. The next type of fat that we'll talk about are phospholipids. Phospholipids are the most important molecule, molecule in cells, and that is because they form the cell membrane. So if you remember the phospholipid bilayer, that is what we were, we were talking about, okay? So the phospholipid bilayer forms the cell membrane, and it is very similar to a triglyceride, 
But in this case, with the phospholipid, we have something still on yellow, switched to blue, I mean black. Okay, we have something that looks like this, okay? So here we go. If we look at the cell membrane, we have a phospholipid bilayer, which means we have two layers of these. So imagine these drawn all this way and obviously this way and then up here as well. Okay, and so with this phospholipid, instead of having three fatty acids, we have two fatty acids down here, and those fatty acids are now composing this region that is referred to as the tail. So this would be the tail region down here. And then the region up here would be referred to as the head. Okay, so we have two um, areas in there. And the tail region is, because it has those fatty acids in there, the tail region is hydrophobic, so it is water-fearing. So it does not mix well with water, which is why we have the tails facing each other. And the head region is hydrophilic. which means water loving. So with the way that the cell membrane is set up, the tails face each other and then the head regions are gonna to touch either the intracellular fluid, the fluid inside the cell, or the extracellular fluid, the fluid outside of the cell. We'll talk more about the cell membrane and its properties when we get to the next chapters on the cell. This next figure shows you a better picture, obviously, of the phospholipid. And here you can see the fatty acid tails on the bottom down here, and up in the head portion where we have glycerol, we also have a phosphate group, okay? And so that is why it's called a phospholipid. So there are phosphate groups associated with the heads of each one of these molecules along with the glycerol, and then the tails are composed of the two fatty acids. Okay, cholesterol falls under a group of fats called steroids. Okay, so steroids are fats, Cholesterol falls under this group, and you've probably heard of cholesterol before because we can have uh, good or bad cholesterol. We're always interested in that. So let's talk about the different types of cholesterol. First type is HDL, and what that stands for is high-density lipoprotein. And then we also have another group called LDL, which is your low-density lipoprotein. Okay, now we know that our HDL is our good cholesterol, and then our LDL is our bad cholesterol. And the reason for this is because if you look at this term, lipoprotein, what this term lipoprotein means is that it is a fat associated with proteins. So a high density lipoprotein actually has a higher density of protein to fat ratio. So in a high density lipoprotein, there's actually more protein than there is fat. And in a low density lipoprotein, there is actually more lipid than there is protein. Okay. So a high density lipoprotein has more protein than lipid. A low density lipoprotein has more lipid than protein. Um, so high-density lipoprotein, just by that definition, you can tell is better because there's more protein than fat. The other thing is that the body readily clears out HDL. 
uh, to rid of. So it always kind of keeps those numbers pretty low. But for some reason, the low-density lipoprotein does not get cleared out of the body as well, so it stays in the body. So therefore, if you have more low-density lipoprotein in the body already, the body tends to hold onto that and keep that there. And so the higher that number is, then the you know, more risks you're going to have for things like cardiovascular disease as those cholesterol stick into the arteries and then build plaques. Also under steroids, but derived from cholesterol, are sex hormones. And this includes things like testosterone, estrogens, progesterone, and then we also have other types of hormones like cortisol that fall into this category. Here is a picture of cholesterol with, with its carbon rings. So here we see cholesterol in this top picture up here. And you'll notice that things like estrogen, testosterone, and cortisol all look very similar to cholesterol. Now B, C, and D are different hormones, estrogen and testosterone being sex hormones, cortisol being another type of hormone, but you can all see that they look very similar to cholesterol as they have been derived from cholesterol. All right, let's talk about the next group of organic compounds, uh, which would be proteins. This is actually the most diverse group that we can talk about. Of organic compounds, both chemically and functionally, and we'll be listing a few of these so that you can see later on what I'm talking about. All right, the monomers of proteins are referred to as amino acids, so amino acids make up proteins, and therefore proteins are chains of amino acids. We also have something called peptides, and peptides are smaller chains of amino acids, so they're not a full protein. We can also say that peptides are pieces of proteins. Amino acids are put together Remember, amino acids are put together by dehydration synthesis, and when they are put together, they form what are called peptide bonds. So they're put, to, put together by dehydration synthesis, and those bonds that are formed between them are referred to as peptide bonds. On this figure, you can see the variety of amino acids. It's important to note that there are 20 different amino acids. And based on how these amino acids are put together, these make all the proteins in your body. So you can see that they're divided into groups on whether they have nonpolar side chains, polar side chains, right, whether they're hydrophobic or hydrophilic, and then whether they ha are acidic negatively charged or basic positively charged. In this picture here you can see how the amino acids, the monomers of a protein are amino acids and so when they come together they form a peptide bond which we're seeing here and they get put together by dehydration synthesis. Please do not forget these concepts. They're put together by dehydration sy synthesis, removing that water and creating a new peptide bond. If we wanted to take these apart, we would add that water um, by hydrolysis or decomposition reaction and then we could take those individual amino acids apart again. Let's talk about different protein shapes, okay? The first protein shape is primary, and that is basically just a sequence of amino acids. So as that protein is made, it is a chain of amino acids, and that would be its primary shape. 
the secondary shape uh, would start to have things called alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets. Alpha helixes look like uh, coils. And let's put this here. Come on. Beta pleated sheets. Would be kind of like an accordion fold. In there. So once we get into the secondary structure, that's where the protein is going to start getting some more of a folding shape. In primary structure, it's going to be a straight sequence of amino acids. Secondary structure, it's going to start to get some changes in how it, the amino acids are interacting with one another. In tertiary structure, this is where the protein gets what is called a globular structure or a more three-dimensional shape. Uh, the protein actually will fold on top of itself in order to get this type of structure. The alpha helixes and the beta pleated sheets are still there. They're still incorporated, but now this is a 3D um, globular shape. It is the final shape of the protein, okay? And then finally, we can have quaternary quaternary structure. Not all proteins have this, so these are found only in proteins with multiple polypeptides. So that basically means that there are two or more polypeptide chains proteins that are coming together. So not all proteins actually have quaternary structure. Some stop, many stop at the tertiary structure and we only have some that actually go to quaternary structure. Here are some different types of models of proteins. A shows the ribbon model. B would show a face spilling model. This is more of what it would look like in a three-dimensional shape. And then C of the same protein would be what we call a wireframe molecule. All right, so let's look at some pictures. So in this first picture, we have primary structure. This is where we basically have just a chain of amino acids. So as those amino acids are put together and forming peptide bonds between one another, we just have this straight chain of amino acids that's primary structure. Then it starts to move into its secondary structure. And I didn't have the fancy symbols to write this before, but you can see that we have alpha helixes that are here. They have a very spiral or coiled sort of shape. And then your beta pleated sheets are down here where it's more of an accordion fold. So proteins can have a variety of these different folds. Um, maybe they don't have some of them at all, but you can notice how they get those incorporated into the actual protein. So once they fold into that secondary structure, that alpha helix or those beta pleated sheets or a combination of both, those will stay within the protein themselves. Then the whole protein starts to fold on top of itself, which is what you see in this picture here, and that is the tertiary structure. So the tertiary structure is the final structure of that protein. It's a globular structure that's in there. Occasionally we'll have some proteins. An example of this would be um, collagen would fall into the quaternary structure. But what you notice here is look at that picture and what you'll see is that there is purple in there and then maybe like a bluish purple. So there's two variations of colors in there. So what they're showing you is in order for quaternary structure to be achieved, we have two different proteins that are coming together and folding over into one another. So this is important because that's how that protein will function later on. Not all proteins do that. 
An important concept to remember is that protein shape determines its function, okay? Therefore, all the proteins in your body are made in the same exact way every time. Therefore, they will have the same amino acid chain, the same folding, and the same function. If something goes wrong with those amino acids and how they're placed together, then we could change the shape of the protein. And then if we change the shape of the protein, it's no longer going to work the way that it's supposed to. Take this figure that's in front of you for example. This figure shows the red blood cell shape and the fact that it is put together by um, hemoglobin, okay, and various subunits that come together to form this. Um, if you notice here, the primary structure for a normal hemoglobin protein is shown here, and in the second half of the chart, we see one that has a mutation. So in this position right here, uh, where it's supposed to be in a normal protein, a glutamate, and now it is mutated to a valine. So we only have one amino acid change. And the interesting thing about that is sometimes we can have an amino acid change that does nothing to the shape of the protein. But in this case, it's in a very important part of that protein, and so it actually changes the entire shape. So if we just have this one amino acid switch from glutamate to valine, what we notice is that instead of having a normal protein like we see here and a normal red blood cell shape, which is what we need in order to carry oxygen through our body, the cell gets a sickled cell shape because the folding is improper now in this protein. And the red blood cell you can see right here, it has a sickled shape. So this is where we get sickled cell anemia, one of the types where it has a sickled shape. Now this red blood cell can no longer function the way that it's supposed to. The amount of oxygen that it can carry is very little. And therefore, uh, in this patient, this, the oxygen would not be carried through the blood properly as it should be. So. The shape of the protein determines its function, and the shape of the protein is determined by its amino acid sequence. We can also talk about what is called denaturation and renaturation. Okay, If we denature a protein, which is what you're seeing in this top here, we unfold the protein. So the term denaturation means unfolding the protein. So the protein is now no longer in its normal shape. If we denature a protein, that protein cannot work the way that it's supposed to work. As you can see, the normal protein over here does not look like the denatured protein, so therefore the shape has been changed and its function is no longer going to be the same. In some cases, not all, sometimes the protein can be uh, go through renaturation, which is putting the protein back to the way that it was. That doesn't necessarily always happen, but in some cases it can. How can we denature a protein? Some ways that are um, of importance to us is heat. By heating up that protein, we can unfold those protein and break those bonds in that protein. And pH changes can also affect a protein as well. So we can denature proteins by the use of heat or pH. All right, let's talk about some of the different types of proteins that we can find. I already mentioned before that this is the most diverse group of organic compounds, and we find a whole bunch of different proteins in this category. So one type of protein that we'll see are enzymes. Okay, and enzymes are what are called catalysts. And if you remember from bio uh, previously, you probably remember that a catalyst means that they speed up chemical reactions. This allows the chemical reaction to happen much quicker than it normally would happen. Without enzymes present, the chemical reactions could still happen, but they would happen at a much slower rate. Okay, Enzymes do uh, what is called lower the activation rate so that the reaction can occur much quicker. Enzymes have a 
area where they can bind a substrate. So enzymes bind to a substrate. And that would be on the active site of the enzyme itself. So the active the enzyme has an area which is referred to as the active site. The active site is a place where the substrate can attach and then the reaction can occur. Now, an enzyme can be reused, so it can be reused again and again, um, but then the substrate will go on after it's gone through the chemical reaction. This is a lock and key fit. You've probably heard um, that before a lock and key fit for those enzymes um, to bind to the substrate. So it is a very specific reaction. Not any substrate can bind to an enzyme. It has to be a very specific type of substrate that is going to bind there. We also have what are referred to as defense proteins. Okay, these are proteins that are going to use their shapes to recognize foreign molecules. Foreign molecules. And these are going to be part of our immune system where these guys will come into play. So they can basically use their shapes to recognize foreign molecules. And let's put an example here, things like antibodies. Okay, So they're going to help out in our immune defense. We also have a category of transport proteins. And just like they sound, they help uh, regulate substances going across the cell membrane. transport proteins in which they can transport small molecules and ions. Let's give you some examples here. Um, we can have hemoglobin, oxygen transport. Once uh, hemoglobin is once oxygen is removed from hemoglobin, it can then go into the cell membrane. We also have a, another type of protein referred to as myoglobin, very similar to hemoglobin, just like its name um, sounds, but this is going to carry oxygen in muscles. And then we also have another protein called transferrin, which can transport iron in the blood. And of course, once these get transported uh, into these different areas, then they can be taken up by the cell to cross into the cell membrane as the cell needs those things. We also have another category of proteins referred to as support proteins. These are going to form major structure in muscle fibers, right? And um, hang on a second. Let me see what I'm doing. Okay. In muscle fibers and in other tissues. And examples of these are fibrin, which we would see in blood clotting, keratin, which would be in the hair and nails, and skin as well. And we also have collagen. Collagen is found all over the body, so that's in a lot of different, I'll put a couple places here, but that's basically in almost all your um, organs, tissues, we have this everywhere. So we have collagen tendons, skin, ligaments, bones, is where we're going to find the majority of the collagen, but there's collagen in other areas as well. Alright, proteins are also involved in motion. 
we have contractile proteins in muscles and these are going to consist of what are called actin and myosin. Without these, we would not be able to have muscle contraction, so these are important for um, muscle contraction. Regulation. These proteins can act as steroids and hormones. They also act as intracellular messengers. And they can shut genes off during development. Some examples of these are lipoproteins. We just talked about those. They can help regulate cholesterol. And we just talked about those being HDL and LDL. They can help to regulate the cholesterol. Insulin that we find in the pancreas. You've probably heard about insulin um, with diabetes, right? So this can, what insulin does is it balances blood glucose, sugar levels, so when those levels are not proper in the body, a person can have diabetes where they're not capable of regulating those blood sugar levels. Oxytocin is another um, example of this, and this helps the uterus contract during birth. All right, and then finally, we can talk about storage proteins. These are things like calcium and iron ions, which are stored by binding to storage proteins. Okay, so storage proteins are going to be able to help some things such as calcium and iron to be stored within the body. Here's some nice charts for those of you who are visual. These are in your book, so you have access to them. I like how these are laid out because they talk about each type of protein, what their function is, and then some examples. Okay, so enzymes, um, their function, examples of enzymes, storage proteins, defensive proteins, and you can see the nice pictures of what they look like. I know this is a lot of information, and we're going to be talking about uh, different proteins throughout the the chapters as we get to them. Um, so take a look at this and make sure that you understand these different proteins that are here. This is the other part of that figure. Again, it's in your book where you can see um, some of the other groups where we have hormonal proteins such as insulin we just talked about, contractile and motor proteins, receptor proteins, and structural proteins. So for those of you who are visual learners, this is a really nice, concise way to look at all the different types of proteins that I had just mentioned. So the final organic compound that we're going to be talking about are nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are made up of what are called nucleotides. So nucleotides are the monomers of nucleic acids. And nucleotides are composed of several different things. Nucleotides contain a sugar, a phosphate group, and what is called a nitrogenous base. The best known nucleotide itself is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. ATP is important because it is the energy currency of the cell, and it is actually an individual nucleotide. Okay, but what about these nucleic acids? In these nucleic acids, we have DNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid, and DNA is composed of nucleotides. Okay, and in those nucleotides, 
we have nitrogenous bases. And those nitrogenous bases is where we get our base pairings from. So we talk about things like adenine, which we refer to by A, guanine, G, and we can also have cytosine, and thymine. Of course, we have a phosphate group, and then we have the sugar. And the sugar for DNA is deoxyribose, like its name implies. Other than DNA, we have RNA, ribonucleic acid, and that is also composed of nucleotides. That is the monomer, where we also have nitrogenous bases, and I'm just going to put the letters for the ones that are the same. So we have, we still have adenine, guanine, and cytosine. The difference here is that we do not have thymine. We have uracil instead. So uracil is denoted by the U. So no more thymine. We have uracil. And the sugar, we have phosphate group, and we have the sugar, and in this case, the sugar is ribose, just like its name implies. All right, let's, let's take a look at this. Um, the central dogma of biology is going from DNA to RNA to protein. We'll talk a lot more about this concepts in upcoming chapters, but so that you get an overall idea, here we are in the nucleus. You can see the double-stranded DNA depicted in the blue, making the single-stranded messenger RNA or mRNA. Okay, so we go from DNA to RNA. The differences here would be that DNA would have thymine, RNA would have uracil instead, DNA is double-stranded, and RNA is single-stranded. In order to get protein, mRNA has to move out of the nucleus of the cell, where it attaches to a ribosome in the cytoplasm, and from that point, it synthesizes proteins. Proteins are made of amino acids, so you can see the amino acid chain being formed here. Here is a picture of what um, the nitrogenous bases would be for DNA and RNA both. Uh, so what you see here is we have a sugar phosphate backbone. Get this. Here we go. Sugar phosphate backbone. And on that sugar phosphate backbone is where we're going to have the different nitrogenous bases. Now the nitrogenous bases are important in DNA and RNA because this is where the base pairing will be, especially in DNA. In DNA, we have thymine like they're showing you here. In RNA, the difference is that we don't have thymine, we do have uracil. So you can see the different pictures of the nitrogenous bases and the different sugars that would be here, deoxyribose in DNA, and then the ribose being in RNA, and that is a typo. So this should be RNA. Sometimes there are typos in the book figures, so make sure you take note of that. That should be RNA, and that is most likely a typo in your book. All right, here is a blown-up picture of these guys, cytosine, thymine, uracil, adenine, and guanine. We normally say, you know, A-C-T-G-U because it's a lot easier. All right, so how do these guys come together? We have base pairing. I keep talking about this base pairing. So G pairs with C and A pairs with T. If we don't have um, T because we're talking about uh, RNA, then we, we would change it to U. So on this side, you can see A pairs with U. So it's G to C always, G to C, and A to T. And if T is not there, then it's going to be U, and this is how they're pairing. Notice um, how DNA is a double helix, and we have this area in here. This 
area in here um, come together by hydrogen bonds. So I had mentioned before when we talked about chemistry that hydrogen bonding is a weak bonding. This is good because what this does is we're able to break open the DNA, get parts of the DNA out that the body needs, and then the DNA can come back together with those hydrogen bonds. We don't want a very strong bond there, but the base pairs do attach to one another through these hydrogen bonds that are there. All right, these last slides, I'm just going to kind of put them up so you can take a look at them. These are in your book as well. I like showing you these because I like you to see that your book is a really good resource uh, for you to kind of study these. Uh, this puts this all together. So it's showing you with the monosaccharide of each one of these biological molecules that we've talked about, some examples of them, and then the functions of them as well. So basically everything that I've kind of point it out to you in a nutshell. So this one's for carbohydrates. Uh, this next one here is for lipids. Again, breaking it down really nicely where you can see what lipids are, examples of some lipids, what they look like, their different components, and then of course their different functions. Proteins. Proteins here that's giving you just an example, a basic example of an amino acid with its different functional groups. There's 20 different ones. And then, of course, examples of proteins. We talked about those in more detail. And then their functions. Okay, this is not an all-inclusive list. I did mention a few more examples and things that you're going to be responsible for. But it's a nice little chart for you to kind of get an overall idea of these things. And then the final one are nucleic acids. Okay, these are important, DNA and RNA. I know I went through that pretty quickly. Uh, DNA and RNA are important because that's where the hereditary information for our cells are. Uh, DNA holds all the hereditary information. From that DNA, we can get RNA. And from that RNA, we can get proteins. And that can do things from making you look like what you look like to performing different functions in the cell, depending on what protein we're talking about. Later on, we will talk a lot more about the process of going from DNA to RNA, of going from RNA to protein, and also of going from DNA to DNA itself. So we'll talk, that's why I went through it pretty quickly, because we're going to go through that in a lot more detail.